<clears throat> We're back with the house on the cliff. We are on chapter three, landslide. That's a shame, fellas, Chip Morton said. This is sure your day for bad luck. First, the eyepieces from your telescope are taken, and now tools from your motorcycles. And all by the same person, I'm sure, Frank added gloomily. Chet put his hands into his trouser pockets and, with a grin, pulled out a pair of pliers, a screwdriver, and a wrench. I was working on the queen this morning, he explained. Good thing I happened to put these in my pocket. I'll say, Frank declared gratefully taking the tools which Chet handed over. He unfastened the housing of the motor and began check, checking every inch of the machinery. Finally, he looked up and announced, I guess I found the trouble, a loose connection. Frank adjusted the wires and a moment later, the vehicle's motor was roaring normally. The housing was put back on, Chet's tools were returned with thanks, and the four boys set off once more. Let's hope nothing more happens before we get home, Biff said with a wry laugh. I'll second that, Joe said empathetically. For five minutes, the cyclists rode along in silence, their thoughts partly on the passing scenery, but mostly on the mystery in which they had become involved. Joe's mind was racing with his throbbing motorcycle. In a few minutes, he had far out distance his brother. Frank did not dare go any faster because of the telescope strapped onto his handlebars. Presently, Joe reached a spot in the road where it had been cut out of the hillside on the right. There was a sharp curve here. The motorcycle took it neatly, but he and Biff had scarcely reached the straightway beyond when they heard a thunderous sound back of them. What's that? Joe cried. Biff turned to look over his shoulder. A landslide, he shouted. Rocks and dirt loosened by recent heavy rainstorms were tumbling down the steep hillside at a terrific speed. Frank, Joe cried out in horror. He jammed on his brakes and disengaged the engine. As he ran back to warn his brother, Joe saw that he was too late. Biff had rushed up and both could only stare helplessly, their hearts sinking. Frank and Chet came around the corner at good speed and ran full tilt into the landslide. Its rumbling sound had been drowned out by the pounding surf and their own roaring motor. The two boys, the motorcycle and the telescope were bowled over by the falling rocks and earth. As the rain of debris finally stopped, Joe and Biff reached their sides. Frank, Chet, they cried in unison. Are you hurt? Frank, then Chet, sat up slowly. Aside from looking a bit dazed, they seemed to be all right. Rock just missed my head, Frank said finally. I got a mean wallop on my shoulder, Chet panted, gingerly rubbing the sore spot. You fellows were lucky, Biff spoke up, and Joe nodded with intense relief. How about the telescope, Frank asked quickly. Take a look at it, will you, Joe? The battered carrying case pushed out of the straps, which had held it in place on the motorcycle, lay in the road covered with stone and dirt. Joe opened it, opened the heavily lined box and carefully examined the telescope. It looks all right to me, he said in a relieved voice. Of course, we won't know for sure until we try the other eyepieces in it, but at least nothing looks broken. By this time, Frank and Chet were standing up and Biff remarked, while you two are getting your breath, Joe and I can take the biggest rocks out of the way. Some motorist may come speeding along here and break his neck or wreck his car unless this place gets cleaned up. Oh, I'm okay, Chet insisted. The rock that hit me felt just like Bender, that big end on Milton High, <laughs> on the Milton High team. He's hit me many times the same way. Frank, too, declared that he felt no ill effects. 
Together, the boys flung rock after rock into the field between the road and the water, and in pairs carried the heavier rocks out of the way. Guess we're all set now, Frank spoke up. Biff, I'm afraid you're going to be late getting home, he chuckled. Who is she? Biff reddened a little. How'd you guess? I have a date tonight with Sally Sanderson, but she's a good sport. She won't mind waiting a little longer. Again, the four boys straddled the motorcycles and started off. A few minutes later, a noise out in the ocean attracted Frank's attention, and he peered across the rolling sweep of waters. A powerful speedboat came into view around the base of a small cliff about a quarter mile out. It was followed at a short distance by a similar but larger craft. Both boats were traveling at a high speed. Looks like a race, Joe called out. Let's watch it. The Hardys ran their motorcycles behind a clump of trees and stopped, then walked down to the shoreline. The boats did not appear to be having a friendly speed contest, however. The first boat was zigging, zigzagging in a peculiar manner, and the pursuing craft was rapidly overtaking it. See, that second boat is trying to stop the other one, Frank exclaimed. It sure is. Wonder what's up, said Joe tensely. I wish that telescope was working. Can any of you fellows make out the names on the boats? No, the others chorused. The two men standing in the bow of the pursuing craft were waving their arms frantically. The first boat turned as if about to head towards the shore. Then, apparently, the helmsman changed his mind for at once, the nose of his boat was pointed out into the ocean again. But the moment of hesitation had given the pursuers the chance they needed. Swiftly, the gap between the racing craft grew smaller and smaller until the boats were running side by side. They were so close together that a, a, con a collision seemed imminent. They'll all be killed if they aren't careful. Frank muttered as he watched intently. The lone man in the foremost craft was bent over the wheel. In the boat behind, one of the two men suddenly raised his right arm high. A moment later, he hurled an object through the air. It landed in the back of the engine house in the, the center of the craft. At the same time, the larger boat sped off seaward. What was that? Chet asked. I suddenly a sheet of flames leapt high into the air from the smaller boat. There was a stunning explosion and a dense cloud of smoke rose in the air. Bits of wreckage were thrown high and in the midst of it, the boy saw the occupant hurled into the water. Swiftly, the whole boat caught on fire. The flames raced from bow to stern. That man, shouted Frank. He's alive. The boys could see him struggling in the surf, trying to swim ashore. He'll never make it, Joe gasped. He's all in. We've got to save him, Frank cried. And that's the end of chapter three.